So Redline was like so many other brands that got their start in the 70s because of the BMX craze. And I am going to be honest with you guys, I knew Redline just at a surface level. At one time, this brand was synonymous with fast, durable race machines, Proline frames, flight cranks, V-bars. So many beautiful items came from this one company, and it is all thanks to a guy by the name of Lynn Keston. <laughs> So if you're like me, you watch a lot of bicycle races, and if you're also like me, you get really annoyed when you pay for a certain platform and then half of the races are region locked. But thanks to today's sponsor, that is no longer an issue. By now, I'm sure you have heard about NordVPN, the fastest virtual private network company that will keep you and your information safe. You guys know I am all about being safe. But to be honest, I love being able to pick where in the world the internet thinks I will be browsing from. This allows me to watch content that is not available in my area. For example, Flow Sports has region locked races that I would love to watch. Now, with NordVPN, I can actually watch them. And to top it all off, NordVPN is not that expensive. Right now, if you pay for two years, it comes out to like three bucks a month because they will throw in four months for free. Again, that exclusive deal is four months extra on a two year plan. If this interests you at all, there's gonna be a link somewhere down below. It's nordvpn.com forward slash mossy. Click on that, you'll get that exclusive deal and you'll be able to watch all the races that you're not able to currently. Let's get to the content. Redline was actually started in 1970 where Lynn and his partner, Mike Conley, were focused on making suspension frames for flat track racing and TT racing, so motorcycles. Just like Mongoose and GT, Lynn had a son that enjoyed riding bicycles. Oh, how this sounds familiar. Think about how many BMX innovations we would not have if these dudes did not have sons to, to be in to bicycles. So in the year of 1973, Lynn made a chromoly BMX style frame for his son for Christmas that year. BMX was in its extreme early stages of development, so he essentially designed this bike with his knowledge of motorcycle frame building. Lynn had to keep the thing hidden from his son, and the only place he wouldn't look was in the back of his pickup truck. So Lynn locked the newly made frame in the back and awaited Christmas Day. Lynn was showing the frame off to a friend of his, and he suddenly got a call. The call was from a guy named Bob Handing. He was president of Shimano Sales in the US. Lynn states that he had no idea who he was and he had never even heard of Shimano. Cause you gotta think, like, although cycling is huge everywhere else in the world, it really only started to pick up steam in America with the, uh, the BMX craze, mountain bike craze, and of course Greg LeMond really helping push the road bike side of things. But all that was kind of 70s, 80s and on. Bob Handing had heard somewhere that Lynn had made this bicycle. He said, I, I don't know how he heard it. He never told me, actually. And, and Bob said that if I was ever in the area where his office was in Sun Valley, that he would like to see this bike. And I quote, I didn't think of it anymore, really. And sometime after that, I don't really even remember how long it was. I was driving down San Fernando Road over in Sun Valley, and I just happened to see Shimano on this building. So I just pulled over onto the side of the road on kind of a lark, and I walked in and asked the reception if there was a guy named Bob there. I couldn't remember his last name at the time and he stuck his head out of an office down the hallway and said, I'm Bob. He came walking up, introduced himself, and he asked if I had completed the bike that they had discussed on the phone. He said, yeah, I've got it out in the truck. So he came out, looked at it, and he said there was a guy up in San Fernando named Jim Emerson who was taking a group of kids out to the LA area somewhere and they had made a dirt track and they were all pretending like they were motorcycle riders and racing bicycles. And so Bob said, you ought to go up there and show this to him. I'm sure he'd be interested in it. I didn't go over there very much, so I figured I'd just drive up to San Fernando and see him while I was there. So I drove up there, showed it to him, and he said there were a couple of people that were making cheap frames. Jim was actually partners with a Mike Devitt who owned Peddlers West. Jim informed Lynn that the frames looked great, but what is really holding these kids back at the moment was the light forks. At the time, they were all breaking. On the drive back, Lynn came up with a plan on how to make a durable yet lightweight fork. He made a couple prototypes and as soon as Jim saw one, he immediately thought it was going to be way too heavy. But to his surprise, it wasn't. It was made of chromoly, but instead of being this thick piece of steel, it was actually hollow. Jim called Lynn after a few days to inform him that the kids were jumping these freaking bikes off the roof and couldn't kill them, and they are awesome. Lynn started selling a decent amount of these 
uh, bulky looking hollow forks, but nothing too crazy until Joel Cohen, a purchasing agent for West Coast Cycles, called Lynn up and wanted to order 1,000 units. The biggest order Lynn had gotten up until this point. Now, and it is worth noting, Redline started, like I said, as a motorcycle frame parts manufacturer. So at the time before Redline was a BMX company, they were like four employees. But right now, these hollow chromoly forks were Redline's bread and butter for about six years. And in 1974, the first Redline frame was produced. Times were very different back then, with, as Lynn puts it, only the Schwinn dealers were dependable and they were only allowed to buy from Schwinn. So Redline had a guy hustling, going around to any and every bike shop trying to sell these new Redline frames for $82.50 a pop. He was only able to sell like onesies and twosies because he was mainly trying to get into these Schwinn dealers. But because of this hustle, between 1974 and 1978, they produced about 10,500 frames. That might not sound like a ton of frames in today's day and age, but at the time, it was a really big deal for them. Next, 1976 was a huge pivotal year for Redline. Let's talk about Champion Motorcycles. Champion was owned by a guy named Doug Schwarma. 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 Doug Schwarma. Redline and Champion were early competitors in the motorcycle frame business. And this is where things get really interesting in my opinion. Yamaha International decided to come out with a division called YDPI to distribute hot rod parts that were made for flat track guys like frame sets and crankshafts and primary case covers and uh, motorcycle parts. They were going to distribute them themselves and there were not a lot of people in the accessory frame business, mainly Redline and Champion. And Redline did a lot of work for Honda in those early years making prototype motocross frames. Uh, they worked a lot with Honda R&D, they worked with Kawasaki, they did a lot of motorcycle projects in the early days. Yamaha sent out a couple of letters, one to Redline and one to Champion. A few months went past and all of a sudden, they saw that Yamaha was selling Champion frame sets. Of course, you, you do have to also realize that this was way pre uh, everyone having a computer and internet. <laughs> uh, Lynn called up who was running Yamaha at the time and said, well, why didn't you go with Redline? The guy said, well, because you didn't respond to the quote. Lynn responded with, I never got anything from you guys. And he said, well, we sent everything out a couple of months ago and, and Champion was the only people that responded, so they just kind of went with them. Shortly thereafter, Redline was doing well enough that they got a larger plant and they were moving. And Lynn actually found the letter from Yamaha behind the secretary's desk. Lynn never saw the quote from Yamaha, so Schwerma got the job, Champion got the job, and had a lot of success with Yamaha. As Lynn puts it, Doug Schwerma was a very clever guy, but he started making a little bit of money, and as Lynn says, how can I put this diplomatically? He inhaled most of it. Pause right here, this is why this is so interesting, because Redline, Redline? Because Redline could be a completely different company if it wasn't for this uh, butterfly effect of things happening. Basically, the two big motorcycle aftermarket hot rod parts manufacturers were Champion and Redline. And both of them were vying for a position, getting their parts distributed by this Yamaha YDPI. Yamaha ended up going with Champion simply because Lynn never responded to Yamaha, and it was because that little letter that fell behind the secretary's desk. And that changed the course of, of Redline's history immensely. Redline stuck to making bicycle parts. It was their bread and butter. And Doug Schwerma actually ended up committing suicide. But Lynn got a call from Schwerma's bank and they were asking if Lynn would be interested in buying Champion's plant. So they actually flew up to the plant, which was in Hayward. Doug Schwerma had been gone for about three months as Lynn recalled it. Uh, he said, we walked into this plant and it was as if the lunch bell went off and people walked out and never came back. Things were set up on jobs. There were cigarettes and ashtrays. Uh, and so they just made him an offer. He said he can't remember how much it was now, but they bought the whole place and the name. And they loaded up a couple of 40 foot trailers and brought it all down to Chatsworth and put it in their plant. And this is where they kind of split the business in two. Instead of Redline making a lot of bicycle stuff and motorcycle parts, they just 
put Redline making the bike stuff and Champion was doing the motorcycle stuff. And then of course Lynn bought out his partner, Mike Conley. Lynn took Redline and Mike took Champion. Redline mainly did bicycle stuff and Champion of course made the motorcycle parts. Champion did still do some bicycle frames, but to my surprise at the time they were actually subcontracted out by none other than Skip Hess of Mongoose fame and you can see the Mongoose video uh, somewhere. Mike Conley continued making bicycles for a bit, but he finally gave up on it and got out of the bike business and went into the crane business of all things. Actually, one of his truck cranes is featured in the movie Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Kind of a cool tidbit. I know it seems like a lot's happened so far, but this is all in the 70s. We haven't even made it to the 80s. In 1980, Redline started producing complete bikes in Japan while still making their high-end frames here in the US. And this was like, like literally Lin flew to Japan. There was only a couple of people at this factory that was gonna start producing the bikes for him that spoke English, and he had to teach these people how to TIG weld these frames. That's how new all this stuff was. It's, uh, it's pretty mind-blowing that this was just in the 70s it, to me. I, I don't know why. This is also around the same time that Redline started sponsoring pro teams like ABA and later Stu Thompson and Greg Hill. Lynn said it was very, very successful for us, but they were very difficult to work with. Stuart and Greg were a couple of brats, actually. In fact, a few years ago, I ran into Greg at a race over in Phoenix somewhere, and he came up to me and he said, I apologize for how I used to be. It could just be his old age. I've never met uh, Lynn or Mr. Castan, whatever. He seems like a straight up dude, but he doesn't hold anything back. <laughs> I find that, find that refreshing. Redline was already huge by the 80s, but their growth didn't stop there. They introduced the flight cranks, which were the industry's first tubular chromoly three-piece cranks, which would become Redline's most popular product and design that is still used to this day. The 80s also saw the introduction of the ProLine 2 and Redline's eventual foray into the freestyle BMX market. And finally, in 1988, Lynn sold Redline to Seattle Bike Company. Now, we are going to talk about the rest of Redline's history, but I often say when the original founder of said company leaves, that company is no more. Just like when Gary Turner left GT. I'm not saying Redline went under or started making crappy bikes or anything like that after the sale. The company just changed. Redline was Lynn up until this point, and without Lynn, of course, the company isn't going to be the same. Redline went on to have a successful business throughout the 90s, introducing a full line of products, and in 2006, Excel Group purchased Seattle Bike Company. Excel at the time owned companies like Ghost, High Bike, LaPierre, Nashiki, Raleigh. Then again, Redline was sold by Excel to Regent in 2019. Regent is just a private equity firm, and Redline has now settled on simply offering a handful of BMX bikes that I honestly don't know a ton about. If anyone has uh, bought a 2019 on Redline BMX product, let me know down in the comments. Let me know the quality. I would love to know. The bikes look pretty decent if you're if you're checking their website, but I have no hands-on uh, with, with a modern Redline. I actually had a Redline cycle cross bike that I, I loved deeply. Now, Lynn made his moolah with Redline, and he went on to open Kestel and came out with a Redline Heritage line of bikes that I loved the looks of, albeit they are out of my price range for something that I would want to just put on a pedestal. So as a giant summary for all of this, uh, it, it definitely seems like Redline was just affected by one butterfly effect after another, one of those hindsight things. It was Redline and Champion vying for a position with Yamaha, and I think if Redline would have went that route, I don't, I think the bicycle portion of it would have probably just melted away or maybe Mike Conley would have taken that over, but Redline would be completely different. Redline would have been a much more motorcycle-centric company than it ever was uh, because they would have that Yamaha contract. But because of that, Redline stuck with making bicycle parts and became the Redline that we all know and love. And then after Lynn sold the company, Redline did have a pretty good trajectory through the 90s with road bikes, mountain bikes, that kind of thing. Well, after a couple of sales, it's, they're more just Redline and name, and that's it. The one part of this story that I, I, you know, what could have been is I wish Lynn would have stuck in the bike industry through the 90s and maybe through the early 2000s like Gary Turner did because I would have loved to have seen some of the innovations that Lynn maybe would have came up with for mountain biking. As you all know, I am a mountain biker at heart. That is my 
real passion within cycling. Even though like the iDrive had its issues and stuff with GT, I love the innovation that GT did in that time frame. And Redline, they had some nice bikes. Like I said, I had a cyclocross bike from Redline, but it wasn't, nothing was like, revolutionary like it was in the 70s and 80s with Redline's BMX products that really kind of changed the industry. That's where Redline is. Of course, I thank you all. Leave down in the comments the next company that you'd like for me to do a deep dive on. I really thought that this one was super interesting just because of how um, good Lynn's memory was about some of this stuff. So if anybody has somebody uh, actually like a figure for me to look into. I'm super interested in that. Thank you all for, for making me do these videos. Uh, I love you. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.